Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Derek, and thank you, Venerable Chanda, for inviting me uh, here. And congratulations to Venerable Chanda and the entire Anukampa project. How auspicious to uh, be invited right after the um, uh, signing of, of the property um, in the UK, Bikuni property in the UK. Uh, really put a lot of joy in, uh, in my heart and my mind. And so, um, to all the people who have contributed to such a beautiful project and to yeah creating all these routes for um, people to be able to practice to access the Dhamma and also to go forth as monastics it's such an incredible um, incredible thing you know up until very recently there was no place for bhikkhunis to actually um, live and practice officially in the UK, and now there is. So really um, recollecting this, this would actually be a meditation practice in and of itself to recollect our own goodness um, in making all of these conditions happen. Um, so it doesn't take one person, and it's not uh, two people or three people or four people. It takes many, many people to um, uh, put these conditions in place. So I'm really, really delighted to um, well, meet today a few of them who have been um, uh, involved in uh, in supporting this project and um, seeing how valuable the Dhamma is and how important it is and keeping it alive after 2,500 years and bringing it in the West um, so we can all partake of these teachings. Um, so yes, once again, Anuadana Satu to all of you and uh, we can start maybe uh, doing a little bit of meditation practice. And then we'll uh, have a few uh, words about the Terigata. So we can start by sitting in a comfortable position, making sure our back is up straight. And we can take a few deep breaths. Relaxing our entire body from the top of the head to the tip of the toes. If there is any point of tension that we can feel in the body or any part that aches, we can send some metta. And breathe in and breathe out. And relax. We can slowly bring our attention up to the breath. Perhaps anchoring our attention to the tip of the nose if it's easier. Or maybe keeping our attention a little bit more open. And we can observe the process of breathing.
every in-breath and every out-breath. without forcing the breath. We're just watching the breath. With deep curiosity. What does it feel like in every moment? mind gets distracted, starts thinking about the past or the future, and gently bring it back to the present moment, back to the breath. without reprimanding ourselves, but rather instead congratulating ourselves for this moment of wisdom. This moment of awareness this moment of peace
And the more we observe the breath, stay with the breath, are present with the breath, the more mind becomes peaceful and calm. And the more the mind becomes calm and peaceful, the more the mind becomes happy. So we can recollect how this happiness is always accessible to us. If only we put the right conditions in place. So we can wish for ourselves to always be happy, always be calm, always be peaceful. Always be healthy, always be safe. Really meaning it, we can shower ourselves with thoughts of loving kindness. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be safe. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be safe. May I be free from suffering. May I be free from greed, hatred, and delusion. May I be happy, may I be healthy, may I be safe. And we can extend this wish to all the people tonight who have gathered together to practice together. May we be happy. May we be healthy. 
May we be safe. May we be free from suffering. Free from greed, hatred, and delusion. May we be happy. May we be healthy. May we be safe. And we can keep growing and growing and fueling the metta, loving kindness in our hearts. And extending it more and more. Including all the different wonderful beings and donors who have supported Anukampa throughout the years. and have made the new Vihara possible. May they all be happy, healthy, and safe. May they be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. And we can keep growing and growing and extending our loving kindness to every single sentient being. Why would we exclude any sentient being? Why would we ever wish for anyone to be anything other than happy, peaceful, and safe? free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May 
May all beings be happy. May all beings in this world and in other worlds with bodies and without bodies, human and non-human, may all beings be safe. May all beings have happy minds. May all beings be free from greed, hatred, and delusion. Free from old age, sickness, and death. Free from birth. Free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings swiftly attain Nibbana for their benefit and the benefit of others. We can slowly open our eyes and come out of meditation practice while holding these thoughts of loving kindness in our mind and heart. Right, well, thank you to everyone for practicing together. It's good to see that some friends have joined us in the meanwhile. So as mentioned at the very beginning today, we're going to um, have a bit of discussion on the Terigata. Uh, it will be the first episode of um, a three-part series. And the reason why we're going to uh, talk about the Tirigata in particular um, is that actually this was um, has been so far my first translation project from uh, Pali to English and actually Pali to Italian. I'm originally from Italy, so hence the little bit odd English that I speak. <laughs> um, so I apologize in advance if some things um, might 
uh, not be really correct in English. It's more my Italian English. But anyway, um, so I translated um, the Tirigata from Pali to English last year and um, then composed a little Tirizin, uh, it's called. So if uh, for anyone who's interested, I forgot to actually get a copy here. I don't have it um, around, but um, there should be, actually you can go to the new Vihara soon, very soon when Venerable Chanda comes back and you can actually get your paper copy there. I was about to say, you can send an email if you're really impatient to info at fpcloud.org and we can send you a copy. Uh, but otherwise, you can um, just wait a little while and you can pick it up at actually Anukampa Bikuni Vihara in the UK. Um, so yeah, so, um, well, first of all, actually, first of all, we should pay homage to our regional teacher, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, before I uh, start giving a, a bit of um, uh, reflections on Dhamma. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Bhutam tamam sankham namasami. So, as mentioned um, last year, I undertook this uh, project of translating the Trigata. And uh, you might ask, well, especially in English, uh, there are actually quite a few translations of the Trigata available already. So, why another translation? <laughs> And um, that's a very valid question. Um, and in fact, there are two reasons. Well, one, actually, I wanted to um, learn the Pali language and I wanted to translate. So that's a very kind of uninteresting um, sort of reason. Um, and I picked um, the Terigata just because I thought it was going to be a short, tiny project. So I was like, I want to actually, for my first project, do something that is um, where I can see the foreseeable end. Um, and it's going to be quite simple, not knowing that actually Pali poetry is the most advanced type of translation that one can start. So actually it took <laughs> considerably a lot longer than had I started with um, any type of, of sutta. But also because once I started actually um, translating and um, the texts, um, I started realizing that a lot of the translations um, that I was finding were not always 100% um loyal to the text but the translation was actually uh, taking into consideration the commentaries um and sometimes the translation uh, was at least it seemed to me an apparent contradiction to what the text um, were saying so there's nothing wrong of course in taking into consideration the the commentaries and it's actually quite great that um those um texts are available but i sort of never was really personally very inspired by the commentaries, especially when it comes to uh, female monastics. There's lots of stories of theories that um, I personally never found too uh, inspiring for my, my, my practice. They didn't inspire my faith. Um, for example, women are always uh, somewhat described as women in for countless lifetimes. There seems to be that everything is impermanent except for <laughs> the sort of um, kind of gender or sex uh, that one is born with. So it was like, oh, that's kind of like bizarre that all the, the bhikkhus were males before and kept for countless eons and all the <laughs> bhikkhunis were females for countless eons. Uh, that's bizarre. <laughs> And they all made the vow to, I don't know, it was a little bit kind of mm, perplexing. And then sometimes there were, you know, mm, some things that, yeah, that um, once again, they weren't quite inspiring um, faith in, uh, in my mind. So I decided to actually kind of put all the stories of the commentaries on the side and, um, uh, just venture into this translation project with 
pretending like they didn't exist um, to begin with. And actually in the Tirigata, you can find many stories of bikunis, um, so in their own words. So it's not someone else who has um, described where they're coming from or uh, what they were in past lives, etc. but actually they, um, they um, tell their stories. Um, sometimes maybe there's not as much information, actually most of the time there's not as much information as there is uh, in, uh, in other texts, but uh, most of the time since it's poetry actually there is some really like kind of like a really interesting core of information in it um, that is meant to um, be thought provoking and um, give us a, a lesson of Dhamma. But while I was, um, you know, during this translation project, uh, a lot of interesting, unexpected things sort of happened. And uh, first and foremost, I have to say that what really was apparent was um, my bias coming up and also other people's bias when it comes to uh, sort of, you know, the, the experience of of um, why someone, for example, becomes a monastic. One of the favorite uh, asked questions uh, from many lay people, whether it's bikus or bikunis, usually the first question is, why did you become a monastic, <laughs> right? Um, and, uh, you know, I just came actually back from um, a month and a half um, in Italy, the, the country where I'm originally from. And, um, I was actually, uh, yeah, with a group of um, Italian people that were not uh, Buddhist, um, but they, you know, in Italy, we have obviously a long history of monasticism, um, of Catholic monasticism, a millenary history of monasticism. So there's also some biases and ideas there as well as of why women, you know, become um, monastics. But anyway, so the person was, doubly interested in why I had become uh, a monastic. Uh, one, because I was a monastic and also I was a Buddhist monastic, but I was Italian, I was clearly not Asian. Um, but anyway, so I told my story and um, actually my story was, was pretty much because I've become, I started practicing the teachings of the Buddha and I became happier and happier, but you know, I was not coming from any type of sort of <laughs> um, extreme distress or extreme suffering um, of sorts. And so the Italian man apparently was perplexed from that because he's like, at a certain point, he was like, didn't you experience a tragedy of sorts? And I was like, no. And I, I thought, what a bizarre question <laughs> to just go around and ask people, hey, did you experience a tragedy today <laughs> or in the past couple of years? So I thought it was a little bit bizarre, but then it occurred to me later on that that is one of the sort of stereotypes that comes when um, women um, take the monastic form. There's usually the idea, oh, you know, either they are, you know, sort of destitute or unwanted or ugly, or, um, you know, they went crazy, they became widows, they lost their children and so forth, right? Um, actually, even my mother, um, when I ordained, her first comment was like, something along the lines, but you're not ugly <laughs> and you're still young. And I was like, well, well I guess thank you <laughs> for the not ugly part. <laughs> but I was like, what? that's the whole point. Yeah, precisely because I'm not, um, I mean, forget about the, the ugly part, but I was like, exactly because I'm not that old I'm still young that's why I ordained because I still have energy to practice the Dhamma so I was really perplexed by her comment but then in hindsight I understood there is this idea that um, you know one kind of chooses this path when they have nothing better to do and she was like yeah you still have you know so many options with your career like you can proceed in fashion etc and I was like yeah but I'm not I'm not interested I've done that already um, so it's interesting that uh, in the Tirigata, when we come to when it comes to the stereotype, actually there are some stories um, that, of course, these are you know things that happen in 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 um, in the world, whether it's females um, or males, uh, anyone can happen to uh, either you know have really strong health issues or maybe perhaps they. Um, 
lose their partner or their children um, and so forth. And then maybe that can be the, the trigger that kind of gets them into monastic life. And so, of course, it's true today, like it was back in the time of the Buddha. And actually, there's nothing sort of um, wrong in uh, this way, in this entry point. Um, it's something that actually is, can be really powerful. That's the first noble truth that the Buddha is talking about. It's not just, oh, I'm like a little bit dissatisfied because um, I purchased all the bags that there were in the store and I don't have, <laughs> and I'm still like unhappy. Uh, but rather what we're talking about when we're talking about um, suffering when we're talking about the dukkha we're talking about uh, old age sickness and death this existential dukkha that doesn't matter how many you know um, bags we have or not or how many properties we have or not or how much anything we have uh, in the world we still are um, that is our kind of fate um, and that is that existential dukkha that the buddha gives us um, the promise, the assurance that we can actually end that suffering that is possible to end. Um, and so it's not that 10% happiness, but it's that 100% happiness uh, where the teachings of the Buddha are extremely optimistic. And so, of course, when, you know, we can be very confused in samsara and get very distracted with all sorts of sensual pleasures. And then sometimes when we instead experience, have strong experiences of, um, yeah, especially um, old age to a certain degree, but definitely sickness and death uh, of people that we really love and care about, then of course that can be a sort of trigger that um, makes us realize that there must be something more uh, to what we were trying to um, kind of like achieve and look look for up to that point. And so of course we have these examples in the Tirigata. Um, so for example, uh, Chanda, not our Bikuni Chanda from Anukampa, <laughs> but Bikuni Chanda where she gets her name from, um, who uh, was in fact a widow and um, destitute. And then she sees a Bikuni um, around and she sees that there's something, there is another way out uh, to, to distress. So then there is um, stories like the one of Vasetti or Kisagotami um, that both had experience, um, you know, the, the death of, um, of, um, of family members. And so there's Vasetti who, you know, for example, is naked, sleeping in rubbish piles on the streets, um, going kind of completely crazy. And Kisagotami who had lost uh, her husband, her children, basically the entire family um, is um, put on a funeral pyre and she lives in the charnel ground next to the half eaten body of her children. And then she understands the teachings of the Buddha and like really pierces through the Dhamma and, and attains awakening. So obviously these are powerful stories. Um, and I wouldn't say that there's not, that there's anything wrong in, in, um, including these stories as stories, as entry points, once again, uh, to the path of uh, becoming a monastic, but it's important that they shouldn't be the sole sort of um, description. Um, and definitely I would separate it from the most, from instead a harmful stereotype that is kind of like put together with this one, uh, which is the one that usually is suggested in terms of monastics uh, that are taking the, mm, um, like women that are taking on the monastic uh, path as a form of livelihood because other forms of livelihood in samsara are not available to them, you know, as, uh, as lay women, essentially. So we're like, okay, well, kind of like, <laughs> uh, I can't do this. I can't, you know, maybe get a husband because apparently there's the idea that that should be an aspiration for women to, <laughs> uh, to get married of, of sorts. So maybe that's not available to them or maybe a job is not available to them or whatever form of livelihood so then they pick um, uh, they become monastics and so this stereotype is um, is very insidious I would say um, and it is also present not only like in kind of what we might say more conservative sort of environments but it's also present in feminist textbooks or in theories expressed by monastics who are supportive of bikuni ordination or bikunis themselves and also in our own minds as women actually you know especially when we're talking about ancient India uh, 
I had to see that in my mind as well. Like there's usually that, the, that kind of unquestioned belief that women at the time of the Buddha were, you know, subservient to men, to men and that uh, their life was basically close to infernal. Uh, it's pretty much a kind of like description that you can find pretty much everywhere. And sometimes this sort of theory is used to justify, um, well, other theories behind certain interpretations of the texts or of the precepts in the Bhikkhuni monastic code that are in obvious actually contradiction with the Dhamma in my opinion, um, or that are in contradiction actually with the Vinaya as well, like with the Patimokha or with the Lipanga as well uh, in, the, in the Bhikkhuni Vinaya or actually are even in complete breach of contemporary human rights. Like for example, the idea that female monastics should never be alone. That should be always uh, with uh, you know, another female companion um, or that they should be subver subservient to bhikkhus. So follow the garudamas, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but anyway, this is a whole kind of other, <laughs> don't want to open the Pandora's box on, um, on this particular, um, particular topic, but rather mention it as, uh, as something to keep in mind there. Um, this is also, you know, kind of like, there's also a pervasive idea suggested that women at the time of the Buddha would become monastics because it would allow them um, to escape from the terrible life as, as lay women, right? And um, also the idea that the Buddha was so ahead of his time that he allowed women in in the order, in the Sangha, despite all odds, you know, in a time and place where there were no women uh, who were spiritual practitioners. And I have to say that once again, myself, like when I started this um, translation project, there were some of these um, assumptions, these biases in the mind. Um, but then as I was translating the text, you know, I was finding most often than not, a different story. And actually in reading the suttas, you know, there's lots of different things that actually are not quite what we think. <laughs> and um, well, first and foremost, actually the Buddha was not the first one uh, to allow women to follow the spiritual path. As a matter of fact, we see uh, in fact that there were female contemplatives of other orders. And in the Terigata, they're not described as you know, something exceptional, like, oh, there was this random <laughs> woman who was actually a spiritual practitioner. It's actually just um, quite matter of factly, no different how there were um, housewives or there were um, women, you know, working here and there, like basically, you know, Nanduttara and uh, Guadda Kundala Kesa are the two examples that are very striking within the Terigata um, that are both two wandering ascetics that um, are actually practicing many of the precepts that <laughs> uh, are that we practice as as bikunis, but also you know things that actually were in contradiction with the precepts. So we see that you know part of it was uh, the correct path, and part of it uh, was actually a lot of was mixed with a lot of sila bhakta paramasa. Um, so Nanduttara, for example, was, um, you know, doing the ascetic practices of cutting her hair and sleeping on the ground, but she was also like uh, setting up fires and using makeup. Um, so all this idea that there was purity uh, in uh, certain rituals, like setting up the, doing the fire rituals uh, in order to attain purity and also using makeup. Uh, so cultivating vanity. So on one hand, she was trying to uh, do all these practices of letting go of, of vanity on the other hand she was actually increasing the vanity so being a little bit confused or Banda Kundala Keza also wandering ascetic um uh, doing several different um following several different um, precepts uh, but then not being capable of distinguishing uh, what she says um, as the blameless, between the blameless and the blameful. So getting things a little bit wrong, uh, we can probably all identify with uh, <laughs> uh, with Padda Kudala Kesa a little bit, no? In our path, sometimes, you know, the Dhamma is counterintuitive. So we're like, oh, I thought that that was like the correct thing to do, but instead actually it's incorrect in, um, it's not in accordance with Dhamma. So anyway, both of them, when they, encounter the Buddha, the Buddha sets them in right view and um, they then ordain under him. Um, 
and but also once again in the text uh like in the suttas in general we see actually that there are women um who are independent type at the time of the buddha or that refer to in a way that is is quite different than what we would expect actually uh queen mallika of course is defined as very influential by the buddha uh, but then there's also this brahmin lady uh, of the vira um Virat Hachani clan uh, who is actually reported to send her male student <laughs> uh, to fetch the bhikkhu dai so clearly it was not inappropriate for for women um to teach to have male students so to teach males so a little bit different than maybe what we might expect and then getting back to the terigata i remember i was quite shocked because once um when i was translating sundari's poem at a certain point there is a part where the elder sundari actually receives an inheritance uh from the uh her father the brahmin sujata who had attained awakening uh under the buddha and so had become a monastic and she actually uh, refuses the inheritance and decides to uh, become monastic, <laughs> just like her father. But I remember when I uh, encountered that part, I was like, oh, how's that possible? Is it possible that, you know, like women could not <laughs> have an inheritance, you know? Actually, I think in the UK, it was only possible, uh, it wasn't possible to have their to inherit money up until like a century ago right so something quite recent well apparently in ancient india <laughs> um they were 2500 years early <laughs> with the inheritance of women um, for women so yeah quite shocking for me rather than to read that in the text to find in my mind that there was that belief that unquestioned belief in my mind i was like where is this coming from <laughs> It's a little bit different. And also then we see other poems, like the poem of Suba, um, where she uh, describes herself. And I think I have the, um, a quote, um, yeah, here. So uh, she defines herself as young and pure. And she says, I left behind relatives, workers and servants and prosperous village fields, pleasing and delightful. I gave up much wealth for the sake of going forth. So in her poem, uh, when she, well, first of all, it's kind of interesting, um, actually her and Sakula, Sakula afterwards says, um, I was home when I heard the Dhamma from a bhikkhu. I saw the stainless Dhamma, the path of, to Nirvana, that which never dies. I left behind daughter and son, wealth and grain. I had my hair cut off and went forth into homelessness. So it seems like neither Suba nor Sakula are asking for permission to their husband. Actually, they don't even mention the husband at all. <laughs> it's quite, um, I find it quite amusing. And yeah, it seems they're actually quite empowered. And they're talking about their wealth, something that they are leaving behind. Um, so the sort of way in which they're describing their experience is radically different than the experience that we normally kind of label or, or adjust. And I think it's actually quite, once again, um, significant how the husband in the picture is not present at all, is never mentioned. Um, and then we have lots and lots and lots of uh, stories of uh, women who are quite well off and actually quite having quite a, a good time in samsara. <laughs> so Sujata um, is one of them who, you know, is self-described as uh, enjoying all her jewelry, her luxurious clothing, surrounded by many servants. And, um, you know, she's kind of, you know, just having this uh, really sort of... Um, um, enjoyable quote-unquote life um, but she's also kind of bored so she then just goes to the park and then at a certain point has this idea of oh I want to go and see a monastery and then in that moment when actually she goes um, in the in the forest she meets the Buddha uh, she goes she understands the Dhamma and then decides to go forth um, there is also the story of Vimala, the courtesan, who uh, is self-described as being intoxicated with youth, glory, and success, uh, or Anapama, uh, who was very well born uh, with wealth and property, etc., um, having all 
different people, different uh, people that uh, were interested in, uh, <laughs> in getting married with her or Sumeda that um, is supposed to be become a princess and then actually gives a, a Dhamma talk uh, to her, uh, to Prince Anikarata and to her parents <laughs> and decides uh, to, to go forth, but none of them actually seems to me um, to have that sort of role of subordination that we very often imply. And definitely um, none of them seems to be talking about um, lay life in any different way than say, for example, a bhikkhu when they go forth is described in the suttas, is self-described uh, as wanting to go forth. So the realization the dispassion with samsara doesn't come, um, I mean, comes from, once again, from understanding the Dhamma, from an understanding of the emptiness <laughs> of, of, um, of the things that we normally like attach to, rather than going, oh, well, um, you know, I don't know where Mm, I can't really like, <laughs> I would love to have a great sort of a family and children and this and that, but I can't really have it. So let me go and find um, some sort of um, support, material support as a monastic. And actually, in fact, to imply that uh, women, you know, at the time of the Buddha would want to escape lay life because they had no option, I think it's actually a very problematic statement and quite an offense actually to the teachings of the Buddha, who on the other hand, we see all over the suttas um, condemns taking up monastic life as a livelihood. One of my favorite quotes is um, that I always keep up, I keep recollecting in my mind is um, the instructions of the Buddha. And he says, be the hairs of my Dhamma, not of my material wealth. Because even today, after 2,500 years, you know, as monastics, we are supported by lay people. So as bhikkhunis, we are actually quite privileged because usually we uh, are not, uh, that well supported, um, contrarily to the bhikkhus, and that's great <laughs> because um, bitter, vile, and obstructive to awakening is praise, gain, and honor. So when um, we enter monastic life as a form of livelihood, that is actually not praised by the Buddha. The Buddha praises um, anyone who actually takes this form um, for the purpose that it has been designed by him, which is to attain awakening, it's for the purpose of renunciation, it's for the purpose of relinquishment, um, it's for the purpose to practice the Dhamma. So to actually kind of give these, this sort of inference that there is anyone <laughs> back at the time of the Buddha, of like his great disciples, whether they're male or female, who did that for a sort of other reasons. Um, well, I doubt that they would have, that those people actually would have been, um, you know, um, their teachings would have, their memories would have been preserved for 2,500 years. I think they would have probably <laughs> kind of uh, been overlooked because there was not, they were not probably uh, impressive beings. But rather, um, what we have as testimonies are the impressive disciples of the Buddha who took, actually, who went forth uh, for the right reason, which is to practice the Dhamma. So, um, Essentially, my impression from uh, the translation of the Tirigata is that every single um, story is supposed to be there to represent the, the large spectrum of the human experience and um, no different than the Teras, essentially, so that we can all understand that there's different entry points. Um, I think in the Mahayana, they say the Dharma doors are endless, you know, <laughs> and uh, that is basically what it is. Each one of us has, has different karmic conditions and each one of us has different entry points, um, whether we're lay people or monastics. Uh, what is it that motivates us to, to enter the path? Um, and so we also have, for example, um, you know, Suba, who we were saying earlier that she entered the path when she was um, very young, um, young and pure, she defines herself. You know, she's like, I was young and pure, you know, when I um, entered these teachings. Or there's uh, stories of old um, Pikunis as well, like Sona. Uh, who <laughs> then attains awakening, she says, well, who cares that I'm, you know, decrepit, you know, now I am 
<laughs> completely free of uh, old age, um, sickness and death. Like it doesn't matter. Um, this is just, you know, it's just the body. So we see that also this practice um, is accessible to anyone, regardless of age, old age, young age, it doesn't matter. Um, so wherever we are, the important thing is to practice genuinely and full heartedly. And, um, you know, there are also stories uh, of the experience of the monastics, actually, while they're practicing the struggles that they that they face that are very human, that are very relatable, both for um, us other monastics or for lay people as well. I really love all the stories, you know, the poems of Vijaya or of the, uh, the two elder samas, actually, that um, they all, you know, ex uh, make these statements very, very melodramatic, very Italian kind of <laughs> like, oh, for 25 years, not even for a second did I attain any peace of mind. <laughs> it's like so terrible. Um, actually, there is also Siha that, um, you know, has so many struggles in her monastic life that she feels like she's such, there is no purpose, like there's no kind of, um, future for her and she like even goes to the point of almost like um con like a, uh, con she's contemplating suicide and she almost commits suicide but then she actually has the realization so we see these over dramatic sort of <laughs> um experiences in the practice because this practice can be very, very difficult very hard especially if we renounce everything um and we get into um 24 seven fight with our kilesas. <laughs> and then Mara starts um, assaulting us, right? So we have actually also all those stories where uh, Mara uh, comes and um, tries to, um, yeah, uh, assault <laughs> literally and figuratively and metaphorically uh, the bhikkhunis while they're meditating in the forest. Also interesting, there's a parallel, of course, in the Samyutta Nikaya, the bhikkhuni Samyutta. Um, some are only present in the bhikkhuni Samyutta, but most of them are actually shared with the Terigata uh, of these poems of awakening and all the monastics there are, of course, awakened and they're actually um, alone in the forest meditating, which is once again, very interesting since there are these stereotypes that women are supposed to always have a, a companion. <laughs> well, apparently not in the, in the source text. And um, yeah, so both Soma, where I get my name from, as well as Chara or Upalavana, or for example, uh, meditating in the forest. And here actually we see that there are some specific things that Mara brings up that are kind of challenges um, that are relative, maybe very specific to um, someone with, with a female body. Um, so there is, well, actually Chala, not really in the way that uh, the Buddha, uh, sorry, the Mara tries to kind of question her, her faith and her understanding um, of the teachings of the Buddha and why he's follow she's following the Buddha. Uh, but Soma, of course, is, there is the very uh, known mm, poem where I get my name from, where uh, she is questioned by Mara in, in terms of, uh, like he's trying to instill the imposter syndrome in her <laughs> of like, oh, what are you doing there? Trying to achieve what is, um, uh, difficult to achieve for all those wise men. Everybody knows that women um, can't achieve anything with their little wisdom. So it seems like also at the time of the Buddha, there were some stereotypes that were starting to float um, in terms of perhaps uh, gender discrimination. Mm, and then Upalavana, uh, on the other hand, is... Um, well, is first tempted by Mara in the form of uh, him appearing as, a, as an attractive man. And then uh, since she's resistant, um, he starts threatening with rape. And that's also um, the story of Subajiva in the mango grove, even though that's not technically Mara, but we can say that it's uh, um, another form of Mara. <laughs> And, uh, but they're all fully awakened beings. So they all understand who they're talking to. They also, they all go, I love it. Like, oh, who is this? Oh, it's Mara, the evil one, <laughs> trying to stray me away from, from concentration. So they see right through Mara. 
And um, of course, uh, last thing, there's also stories of, of ordination, of course, throughout the, uh, the Terigata. And it's very important to mention um, the, the story of um, Banda Kundala Kreta uh, that we were talking about just recently, uh, where she actually um, has a bit of a different story than Mahapajapati, <laughs> or the, the one that actually is reported um, to be the creation of the Bikuni uh, Sangha in the, um, well, there's only one part, one uh, in in the canon, uh, only one story in the canon that actually differs in, in the different uh, editions of the canon, which is in fact considered by um, most scholars as something um, that was a later edition, given all the inconsistencies. Uh, but instead, actually, we see the the story of Bada um, Kundalakesa, the ordination of Bada Kundalakesa, that is a lot more inspiring, and so. Um, I have it here, and she says, I saw the stainless Buddha and the honored monastic Sangha. I kneeled, paid respect, and made Anjali in his presence. Come, Bada, he told me, and that was my higher ordination. <laughs> Very simple. <laughs> Very much in accordance with Tama. Uh, no really weird... Um, come well no other monastic who's unenlightened at that time which is the case of ananda <laughs> that is reported to convince the enlightened being of the buddha to ordain <laughs> um, the bhikkhuni and there is also no uh, horrible statements attributed to the buddha about women um being um a threat or a problem uh, for the for the sangha but rather it's quite the opposite the buddha saying yes of course come bada so ehi bate uh, which um ehi bhikkhu or ehi bhikkhuni essentially it's the, the equivalent of hey bhikkhu was the first form of ordination um that was present when the buddha started creating his order um, so before there was a whole ordination procedure, the Buddha would simply um, invite people uh, come to come uh, to enter the Sangha. It was before, you know, the monastics started misbehaving and then they had to follow the Patimaka, etc. So and we see that actually, uh, perhaps then the um, also beginning of the of the order of the Bikuni Sangha <laughs> is a little bit different than what we think. They usually say that it's significantly later than the one of the Bikus, but maybe not. Perhaps not quite, is it? Um, there's also the other, uh, another sutta actually in the, um, in the Majjhima Nikaya, uh, where there is Mahapajapati that is actually reported to in the, uh, that Kinimbivanga uh, Sutta, if I remember correctly, where she is bringing an offering uh, to the Buddha and the Sangha of Bhikkhus and Bhikkhunis. <laughs> so it was quite interesting. Uh, clearly, she could not be a Bhikkhuni herself if um, <laughs> and reported to make offerings while the Buddha is talking about the benefits of making offerings to both the Sangha of Bhikkhus and the Sangha of the Bhikkhunis. So, quite interesting, very, some inconsistencies we see. And yeah, so um, we see that then clearly the history has to be, the history as we are told um, in most um, Buddhist environments is not quite consistent to what we see in the early texts in Buddhism. And also the iconography, I have to say, a lot of it has been kind of lost um, along the way. Uh, so usually in um, most mm, monasteries, most Buddhist monasteries, we see the Buddha, you know, the statue of the Buddha, and then we have next to the statue of the Buddha, usually the disciples of the Buddha, and they're usually two, right? And they're usually male, and it's Sariputta and Mughalana, right? Um, but when we actually look at the characteristics of um, the disciples of the Buddha in general, and the female disciples, <laughs> we see that Kema and Upalavana are, have exactly the same traits, basically, of Sariputta and Mughalana. 
Uh, so they're both uh, Sariputan Kema, they're both the uh, foremost um, in great wisdom and Mogalana and Upalavana are the foremost disciples in psychic powers and um, Mogalana and Upalavana both have exactly the same skin actually apparently so dark uh, that it's the color blue uh, but it seems that uh, throughout the history uh, Sariputta and Mogalana have kind of been remembered but Kema and Upalavana have been a little bit forgotten and I think actually that it's not um, you know, a coincidence that Sariputta and Kema and Mugalana and Palavana have the same characteristics. And it's actually like a very profound teaching in and of itself that they have these similar characteristics because um, awakening is genderless. <laughs> awakening has nothing to do with sex. And in fact, it manifests in the same way as um, we see, actually, I'd like to end by talking by quoting um, my, well, I have three, well, I have, the whole Teddy Gap is actually my favorite, but I will quote here um, the verses of the elder Babda Capilani, who describes, it's like basically the best love story in the history of love stories. <laughs> it's actually the only one where it really ends with, and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> instead of the fake oh, and they lived happily ever after but it's not true um <laughs> especially because you know usually there's death um but here instead Bada Kapilani and uh, Mahakasapa uh so this is basically the the poem of Bada Kapilani and it starts with her describing uh how great uh, Mahakasapa her husband is and they both essentially had gone forth and uh, they both attained awakening. And so she starts by saying, Kasapa, son and heir of the Buddha, has a well-collected mind. He knows his past lives. He sees heaven and hell. He has reached the destruction of birth. He is an accomplished sage with perfect insight. He's a master of the three knowledges, a Brahmin who possesses the three knowledges. In the same way, Baddha Kapilani possesses the three knowledges, has left behind death, and carries her last body, having conquered Mara and his army. Having seen the danger in the world, we both went forth. We have exhausted and tamed all the influences. We have become cool and quenched. So I want to repeat this part. In the same way, Baddha Kapilani possesses the three knowledges. So that's very important in the same way so there is no difference <laughs> and i love it because it's such like an incredible poem um love poem because she first starts talking about how great uh you know mahakasapa is and all his incredible qualities of mind and then she says in the same way i'm exactly identical <laughs> Um, and yeah, we both made the right decision of going forth and attaining full awakening, and it just manifested in exactly the same way. And why is that so, that it manifested in the same way? Well, I will quote um, Bikuni Soma, not myself, but uh, the venerable that actually is much more quotable than me, <laughs> the enlightened Bikuni Soma of the um, time of the Buddha. Uh, where she says, she replies to Mara, how does being a woman have anything to do with a well-collected mind when knowledge is present and one sees rightly into Dhamma? And in the Bhikkhuni Samyutta, there's also the, the verse afterwards that I really love that um, I'll paraphrase where she says, one who thinks I'm a woman, I'm a man, or I'm anything at all is fit for Mara to address. And so it's important to understand how, um, yeah, everything is impermanent, also gender, also sex. And um, it's important to understand that those are certain conditions and that they might influence our experience of reality in a particular way, which is why um, I think it's also very important, the, the poems before that, um, where Mara addresses those issues, um, uh, brings forth those issues, you know, that that can be present when we are experiencing the world with a particular particular body. 
but that um, in and of itself, it's not something that actually alters the way that we experience awakening. It's not something that defines us. And in fact, Mahapajapati Gautami uh, says, um, well, her poem is all incredibly beautiful. So she says, in the past, I was a mother, a child, a father, a brother, and a grandmother. Not knowing the truth of how things are, I came back again and again, not finding what I was looking for. I have seen the magnificent one. Indeed, this is my last body. Destroy this rebirth in samsara. Now there is no coming back to any state of being. So of course, these are all just quotes, not the full poems, but um, this part of the poem, uh, once again, she's a mother, a child, a father, a brother, and a grandmother. So once again, a little bit different than, oh, I was a woman in the past, and I was a woman again in the, in the previous life, and the woman in the previous life again, and the woman in the previous life again, and there is this sense that actually this body is always constantly there, or this gender identity is constantly there, but no, actually quite the quite the opposite. So we see that Mahapajapati instead says, I've been everything, a mother, a child, a father, a brother, and a grandmother. Not knowing the truth of how things are, I came back again and again, not finding what I was looking for. I find this much more <laughs> in line with Dhamma, much more inspiring. And putting in context, once again, the why it's relevant to understand, um, you know, our, our current conditions, not to pretend that they are not there, not to pretend that, you know, our lives aren't, um, that, you know, gender doesn't matter, sex doesn't matter, but also understanding that this is a temporary condition. Uh, last thing that, um, I would like to mention is that actually in the Tirigata, there are also lay women that attain awakening. <laughs> surprise, surprise. And you might go like, hey, how's that possible? Uh, I thought the Tiris were all, um, uh, all bhikkhunis. Well, yes, in fact, they're all bhikkhunis, uh, but not all of them attained awakening in the form as a monastic, but rather actually we have, for example, Ubiri and Sujata, Anna Sujata, who we mentioned earlier, who was, um, you know, enjoying sensual pleasures and having a really great time in samsara until she meets the Buddha in the park. <laughs> well, she was still a lay person when she attained awakening. So when he gave her the teachings, um, she was a lay person, she attained full awakening, she became an arahant right there, and then decided to go forth. So um, let me read her verses. She says, after hearing the great sage, I penetrated the truth. There I touched the stainless Dhamma, the path to the deathless. Then because I had become aware of the true Dhamma, I went forth into homelessness. I obtained the three higher knowledges. The teaching of the Buddha was not in vain. So we see here once again that um, yeah, it's possible. It doesn't really matter the form that we are in. Um, we can, uh, awakening is possible here and there, but it always ends up in this form, <laughs> it seems. Uh, because clearly once one attains awakening, uh, there is no, mm, no point in, uh, in, you know, keeping the, the form as a lay person. Uh, this being said, it's also very important to highlight how the majority of the women in the Terigata attained awakening in the form of a bikuni. And I think it's important to highlight the fact that there are also women who were not bikunis who attained awakening and then became bikunis. Uh, but it's important to see that the ratio is a little bit different. And that's because clearly this form was designed by the Buddha in order to make it very easy for us to, to attain awakening, whether we're men, women, non-binary, and um, transgender and so forth. So very, very important to recollect, but also not to become too sort of uh, obsessed <laughs> with uh, only having this uh, particular, particular form, but rather practicing um, wherever we are and however form we are in our path. All right, so we can end with three sadhus. Sadhu.
Sadhu, Sadhu. So at this point, if there are any uh, questions, comments, um, feel free to uh, bring them up and I'll try my best to address them. I will ask David to unmute. Hi, thanks, Saya Soma. It's a really good uh, meditation and talk. Um, it's just a short comment, really, to say I was quite unsettled before the session tonight, but as the meditation and went on and we were brought into the present moment, things calmed down and it felt really relaxed and natural, which is great. So thanks for that and also i'm looking forward to the next few sessions as well as a really interesting talk tonight so thanks oh bless your good heart um i'm glad that we've had the opportunity to practice together Right, maybe <laughs> I spoke so much that <laughs> everybody can't take it anymore. <laughs> you can also disagree, by the way. <laughs> Manari, yes. Just to say that it was a very inspiring talk and I thought I knew quite a lot about it and I've read this Terigata festival, I've kind of watched those things, but then, you know, the talk that the points that you brought are so new and, um, and it is very inspiring. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manori. Well, it's uh, more questions, I think more than points. <laughs> um, it's good questions. I find them, um, I personally take them as my koans, <laughs> my koan practice as a Tiravada uh, Bikuni. Yeah, really questioning what are the biases that we bring and what we think that we know already. Um, and how is that influencing our practice and also how is that influencing also our identity in terms of whether we have a female body or a male body or uh, any type of body or one identity or another identity it's very interesting I find it actually extremely exciting also as a bhikkhuni to understand really what the what the vinaya is you know for the because it's a little bit um, more straightforward, even though, of course, there's always points of contention and different interpretations uh, of the rules. But for the Bikuni Vinaya, actually, um, you know, there's a lot more. Um, we don't have it that comfortable because if you start practicing everything in accordance to one type of interpretation, then you'll find that certain rules are in contradiction to what you're told. Um, or may maybe two rules might seem to tell you the, the opposite thing. So it can go crazy. <laughs> so it, it's great, you know, actually for me, uh, because it's a very good, good thing of like, what's the purpose of this rule? How is this supporting my Dhamma practice? Anyone wants to disagree with anything that was brought up? <laughs> I always like um, when people disagree. <laughs> I'll ask Judith to unmute. I can't hear you. Sorry, I sorry. 
Ayasoma, thank you so much for your talk today. Um, as a woman, as an American woman, we're in a time of great turmoil right now. And as an older woman as well, uh, this has great meaning to me. And I am a basic beginner to Buddhism. But you brought great comfort and insight and I appreciate everything you had to say as a starting place for me to understand the role of the bhikkhuni. I was very, very grateful. You gave us a lot to think about and a lot to investigate and understand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jaylith, for that sharing. And thank you, actually, to all the women and all the men who have um, actually created the conditions for, for people like me before <laughs> monastic life to actually have this sort of apparent um, idea that <laughs> they're of gender equality. <laughs> that I realized, you know, how that, that was one of the surprises, actually entering um the religious world you know i had a very secular bringing um that things are quite different uh for most women and um <laughs> actually even in the country where i was raised in um it's just that i had picked the particular field the the fashion um editorial field where there is uh, there's a lot of women in uh, in positions of of power, you know, the only straight man who used to uh, work at in my office was the secretary. So <laughs> I had a very different sort of experience than um, than I think most women. And you know that privileged sort of situation um, made me realize how many things I took a, took for granted. You know, once I entered in monastic life, I was like, oh wow. <laughs> And I picked up history books and realized that, you know, a lot of the rights that I was, um, that I had actually were, you know, even became law uh, just a few years before I was born <laughs> in Italy. And so it, it was kind of like my, my assumption that that was, has always been the case, but actually was not the case. So, so we're seeing, you know, I live in America too, we're seeing how fragile actually all these human rights are and how recent they are and how there are so many, yeah, women and men who have fought for us to achieve these things, uh, these rights and how young generations, so uh, younger, <laughs> I'm not that young anymore, but I still keep on thinking that I'm young. That's the illusion. <laughs> it's the mall. <laughs> but yeah, how we dangerously take them for granted. And then all of a sudden they disappear and we're like, oh, wait, um, how is that possible? Well, of course it's possible if we don't understand the fragility of, of certain um, rights and also how important it is to, to really uh, uproot these biases I've realized, especially when it comes to gender in the United States, there's so much conversation on so many different um, identities, um, but I have to say that gender identity uh, when it comes, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of things I think are, are, are very much taken for granted. Um, and we think that we're living in a post sort of uh, feminist um, society when actually no we're not and there's so many biases that are that we all kind of have in our minds whether we're women or not women um, so there's a lot of work I think that needs to be done um, in identifying these biases <laughs> so thank you for all the work that you and many women have done to allow us to to be in a better world these days And I would like to thank you very much, Isoma, for your talk today, for the great talk, and for the inspiration of hearing again about how the early Buddhist women ordained and entered into the path of monasticism and the practice. And if anybody would like to find out more about Isoma's work and her monastery, and 
find out more about everything to do with empty cloud monastery then the web address is now in the chat it's emptycloud.org and it's also a wonderful introduction to the next part of this small talk that i'm going to give because as Ayasoma mentioned at the start of her talk we have just had the wonderful news that there has been the completion of the purchase of the Oxford Vihara for Bikunis, which means that the Anunkampa Bikuni project now reaches its next stage. So many thanks to Kelly, especially for all the work that you've put into that. <laughs> and this is the stage where now Ayachanda, Venerable Chanda, will have a fixed base to teach and to inspire us and to hopefully have some other aspirants and monastics come to stay with her and really help to spread the female bhikkhuni sangha and a place for people of all genders and anybody who wants to practice to come and to be part of the whole project and move forward with the Anacampa project. The property at the moment is quite empty and needs some work. So we would like to ask if anybody feels inspired and would like to continue to support the Anakam Bikuni project, we would be very grateful if you could donate to the Anakam project via anukampaproject.org forward slash donate. All money at the moment will go towards the new property. And when Venerable Chanda comes out of her long retreat in November, then of course we would also be able to again offer food and other supplies for Venerable Chanda, as well as any work that needs to be done on the property. There will be an official newsletter coming to you very soon to announce this with a little bit more detail. And in a future newsletter, we'll also give more details about how the, pro how the property is developing. But for now, thank you very much again, Ayasoma, and we look forward to seeing you again in two weeks' time. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And now we will, as always, unmute you and give you the opportunity to say goodbye and we'll see you again next week, hopefully. <laughs>